Psalm 146 says, Hallelujah, my soul, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles, man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. Happy is the one whose God is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. He opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects foreigners and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Amen? Zion, your God reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. And may the name of our God be praised this morning. Let's stand and bless his holy name.
than rich and miserable. But couldn't something be worked out such as uh, moderately wealthy and just a little moody? Well, we hit that middle ground, just, you know, right in the middle, so not poor, not rich, you know. Well, let's read James 5, 1 through 6, and see what he's, he talks about in, in Money Matters. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. And your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidenced against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, who you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now the final chapter opens with very strong condemnation toward the rich who are oppressing the poor while living in pleasure and luxury. Now most likely these were rich unbelievers such as those mentioned earlier in James 2. Remember in, in the second chapter, he says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable names by which you were called? He's addressing that. James condemns them not for being wealthy, but for misusing their resources. Now, unlike the believing rich in Timothy's congregation, we read in 1 Timothy 6, these are the wicked wealthy. Some may even profess faith, and maybe some have even associated with themselves in the church, but whose real God is money. Gold is their God. And the key is to recall Jesus' teaching. Remember in Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So for prostituting the goodness and generosity of God, these wicked wealthy can anticipate only divine judgment. The Lord heard the cries of the defrauded, and judgment was to come upon them. The rich who had condemned and hated the just. That's the overarching theme. But when we get into verse 1 of, of James 5, the big point here is wealth can be dangerous trap that leads people to eternal destruction. It can be a very dangerous trap. Remember, to be rich without God is to be short-sighted in light of eternity. To be rich without God is to be short-sighted in view of eternity. James begins, come now, you rich. James had developed the idea of the need for complete dependence on God. Remember, that's what we talked about last week. But now he naturally rebuked those most likely... To live independently from God. We think about it. It's the rich. Why, why do they need God for? They, got, they can buy anything they need and want. But there are two reactions to this calling out of the rich. Those who are without money somehow feel that they are more spiritual than those who have money. Well, they're not. And, and on the other hand, those that have money somehow feel they, they need to be defensive. Why? But... Uh, and, and, well, they don't need to do that too. These verses apply to everyone for being rich is relative, isn't it? And, and compared to the rest of the world, everyone in this room is rich. So no matter how much we have, someone else has more. <laughs> and no matter how little we have, someone else has less. So these words in James 5, 1 through 6 are for all of us. Now, while Jesus counted some rich persons among his followers, think of Zacchaeus, 
think of Joseph of Arimathea, of Barnabas. We are compelled to observe that riches do present kind of an additional or a significant obstacle to the kingdom of God at times. And it can also be true that the pursuit of riches is the motivation for every conceivable sin. Remember in Matthew 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. For the love of money, Paul exhorts in 1 Timothy 6, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now, Paul does not say that money is a root of all kinds of evils. He says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. Before they won a $2.76 million lottery jackpot in 2005, Laura and Roger Griffiths of England reportedly never argued. Then they won, and they bought a million-dollar barn-converted house and a Porsche, not to mention luxurious trips to Dubai, Monaco, and New York City. Now, media stories say their fortune ended in 2010 when a freak fire gutted their house, which was underinsured, forcing them to shell out repairs and seven months of temporary accommodations. Shortly after, there were claims that Roger drove away in that Porsche after Laura confronted him over email suggesting he was interested in other women. That ended their 14-year marriage. James rebukes the rich for living as if Jesus was never coming back. Now remember, Moses challenged Israelites not to forget the Lord their God in Deuteronomy 8. And if they did, there were serious consequences that would result. Moses says, take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built good homes and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up. And you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant with you as of this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly, solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Now, if we acknowledge God as a source of wealth and use our resources for God's glory and the building up of his kingdom, then lives will be changed by our humble generosity. We must always keep eternity in view with our eyes. And with our lives. Paul exhorts the church of Colossae with these words. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, our intercessor, our victor, our savior. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. So that first point of being short-sighted in view of eternity, if you think you are rich without God, well, to be rich without God also provides short-term advantages, but long-term loss. Long-term loss. Think big picture, end game, not the here and now. Now, with, with wealth comes power, but someone once said, power corrupts. 
absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we've seen that throughout history, corrupt dictators have amassed amazing power and wealth for themselves and their families, such as Saddam Hussein and his sons are brought down and face judgment in this life. Remember that? But others, such as Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin, they seem to get away with their many atrocities in this life. They're like, God, where's the lightning bolt? But nobody escapes God's judgment. It doesn't matter if you're a good old boy, has the golden ticket, seems to get away with everything. Or if you feel like your family pedigree makes you untouchable. It doesn't matter. Like barn animals, you are only fattening your hearts for the day of slaughter. A comedian once said, if money talks, all it ever says to me is goodbye. And many of you probably say that like, oh, I got my paycheck on Friday and then Saturday hits. You're like, oh, man, we didn't have bills. I can have fun. <laughs> but even comedians can be biblical. <laughs> This is biblical wealth and status at best is only temporary and a part of this world. Therefore, our security should not rest in our wealth and power. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, that modern Sodom suffered a fiery deluge of flames and molten ash. And there were those who, unable to tear themselves free from the things that were to them dearer than life, they turned back. Some 2,000 people lost their lives, among them a woman who loved fine jewelry above all else. As the deadly rain of fire came down, she decided to run to the harbor and escape by ship. And that was wise. But this rich and beautiful woman stayed behind just long enough to collect as much jewelry as she could carry. Snatching up the rings, she having thrust them on her fingers, there was no time to hunt for a box or a bag in which to cram her ornaments. So she picked up as many as she could hold and rushed into the street, clutching her pearls and diamonds and rubies and sapphires and gold brooches and her earrings, a, a wealth of fire that would be placed at thousands of dollars today. But she delayed too long. The poisonous fumes overcame her as she ran, and with all her trinkets, she stumbled, fell, and died, clutching the things she prized so much. And there under the ashes of Pompeii, she lay, and when the excavators found her, she was still lovely, and her hands were still laden with jewels. Not only for the first point that wealth can be a dangerous trap, but James then goes on, verses 2 through 6, to say that we should be careful not to use wealth in an ungodly manner. We should be careful, number one, verses two and three, not to hoard wealth, not to clench so tightly to our possessions because man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. James says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidenced against you and will eat your flesh like fire, you have laid up treasure in the last days. Now think about this. When he says that your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded. In James' time, there were three main indicators of wealth. And he uses these three terms to point to the, to the temporary nature of each of these three things. First, there was grain. There was food. You could store it in large bins or silos, but that food, James says, is rotted. It's rotted. We're, we're good at this every time. Let's clean out the refrigerator. And we're like, look at the hair on that thing. Boy, that got hidden in the back. And it, it rots and rots. Who wants orange, whatever, that should be yellow, and now it's gross. Like, it rots. And then there's, there's clothing he talks about in the world where most of the poor only had the clothes on their back. Now think of that. Now think of your closet. 
and think of most of the world, they just have the clothes on their back. To have more than one change of clothes in, in Bible times was a sign of, of wealth. But the Apostle Paul, when he was addressing the, the elders of Ephesus, he said this, that he could claim that he had come to no one's money or clothes. James echoes Jesus who warns that clothes are subject to the ruin of moths. Remember I mentioned earlier that do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Your holes will ruin as well. So not only do you have food and clothing, but the third thing was gold and silver. James knew, of course, that these metals are not literally subject to rust or corrosion, but in irony and as a paradox, he's trying to make a point that even incorruptible commodities are destined to perish because they're of this world. When God brings judgment, even these precious metals will be doomed to corruption. Think about this. What good was all the gold and silver in the world in AD 70 when Roman general Titus destroyed Jerusalem and slaughtered over a million Jews? Your gold, your food, your clothing mean nothing. And so Chuck Swindoll ties in what we just shared by saying this. In those days, a person could display his or her wealth in three ways. By feasting lavishly, by dressing extravagantly, and by spending wildly. Think about this. Some things never change, right? Look at Hollywood. Look at the Golden Globes. Look down the street. James targets these three areas of a flamboyant lifestyle of the rich, pointing out how foolish it is to center their lives on these things. Through time and use, food goes bad. Garments get eaten by moss and precious metals tarnish. By hoarding rather than sharing, the wealth of the rich rots and rusts. The incorruptible nature of the wealth, James says, it will be evidence against them. It will witness against them all these things of lavishness, of feasting, of clothing, of money. On the day of judgment, it will be revealed that they had lived their lives in their arrogant independence that James previously condemned, heaping up earthly treasures in the last days when they should have been heaping up heavenly treasures. And I think it's, it's fascinating in this section of James that he calls several witnesses to testify against the wicked rich in judgment. He talks about their wealth, and then he says that the wages that they withheld were crying out to them, literally like the money talked. <laughs> and then workers that were defrauded, the cries of the harvester was evidence against them. This is an important truth. There will be no bribing the righteous judge Jesus on judgment day. There's no backdoor deal. There's no, let me put a Benjamin in your pocket that will get you any favor in the eyes of our righteous judge. And so he ends this section in verse two and three. He says, you have laid up treasures in the last days. And when he, when he says this, this is a period between Christ's ascension and his second coming. Oh, we are singing about that today. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. But we were in that time of the last days, but really death is the last day for all of us. And as a rich fool in Jesus' parable found out, he had plenty stored up, building barns for his life. And when he died, he was poor where it mattered the most. He was not rich toward God. So let's not hoard our wealth in selfish ways, but follow the admonishment of Paul in 1 Corinthians or 1 Timothy 6. As for the rich in this present age, these are the wealthy rich that are in the church, Christ followers. He says, do not be haughty, nor to set your hopes on the certainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. The storing up treasures for themselves is a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Oh, perhaps we should say 
aloud again and again the words of the song that this world is not my home. C.S. Lewis put it well, our father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant ends, but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. Guarded or hoarded wealth promises joy, but only brings misery. We begin to love money, it, it ceases to bless us, and, and it begins to curse us. We think that just a little more money will make us happy, but that is deception. There's nothing wrong with money, but money that is guarded and hoarded will never spread the gospel of Jesus. Remember this, if your treasure is here on earth, you're going from it. But if your treasure is in heaven, you're going to it. Amen to that. So let's not hoard our wealth. And also, we should be careful not to cheat people out of money. Don't cheat. Not in school and not in life. <laughs> Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Now the rich had gained some of their wealth by oppressing and defrauding their day laborers. It was strictly forbidden in the Old Testament. If you remember in Leviticus 19, it says, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain with you all night until the morning. In Deuteronomy 24, you shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy. Whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land and in your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day. Before the sun sets, for he is poor and he's counting on it. Lest he cry to you, to the Lord, and you be guilty of sin. These cries of the harvesters, those that were defrauded, reach the Lord of hosts, James says. That word, Sabaoth, is, is, it means armies or it, it conveys a heavenly or angelic army. It's describing God as a, a warrior, like a commander-in-chief of all heavenly armies. Now, I don't want to mess with that. <laughs> the title of this was meant to give these unjust defrauders a very sober warning. The cries of the people they had impressed had come to the ears of the God who commands heavenly armies. The God of might and of power and of judgment. If you remember, the Bible teaches that angels will be involved in the judgment of unbelievers. And we can't fool God. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. We cannot do a sleight of hand in front of the omniscient one. Paul reminds us in Romans 14.12 that each of us will give an account of himself to God. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, is our judge. So let's be people who treat everyone fairly and generously, especially in the context of our financial affairs. Christian business owners who do not pay and treat their employees well do not bring honor to God. Our generosity and equitable treatment of others is a strong defense against any accusation of unfair or illegal financial practices. I mean, I love flipping coupons, and I love saving money, but I never want to be called cheap when it comes to handling other people. If you hire somebody, if you help somebody out, I don't want to be a penny pincher with that. Oh, help us to not cheat others. And then thirdly, in verse 5, he says we should not... We should be careful not to live in luxury and self-indulgence. In luxury and self-indulgence. He just says it directly in verse 5. For you have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now, remember the rich young ruler in Matthew 16? Or Jesus' story of the rich man and, and poor Lazarus? In Luke 16, materialism, it, it's, it's when the physical and the financial take precedence over the spiritual and over the eternal. It comes at a cost. Materialism has a very, very high price tag. A, a magazine advertisement 
told of a shopping spree of an oil-rich sultan. He purchased 19 catalogs, one for each of his 19 wives, and paid extra to have the cars lengthened. He also bought two Porsches, six Mercedes, a $40,000 speedboat, and a truck for hauling it. Add to that list 16 refrigerators, $47,000 worth of women's luggage, two Florida grapefruit trees, two reclining chairs, and one slot machine. His total bill was $1.5 million, and he had to pay another $194,500 just to have everything delivered. Talk about living in luxury. I, I can't complain when Don goes to Kohl's anymore, I guess. I mean, that's nothing on what, what he spent, so. But I love this. Here's a quote from a Quaker. It says, tell me what you need and want, the Quaker said to his neighbor, and I will tell you how to get along without it. <laughs> Many things we think we have to have really aren't so much a necessity. And he challenges them that you have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. What a picture there. Like the cattle in their fields, the rich gorge themselves on luxuries and, and fail to realize that they are headed straight for the final slaughter. They satiated their, their fleshly appetites but starved their souls, which they were in fact preparing for judgment. James' vivid indictment points to the imminence of the coming day of judgment when they will be, in effect, slaughtered by God's sort of perfect justice. These apathetic rich men are like unreasoning cattle who graze in the field all day long, getting fat, not knowing that the day of slaughter is coming. And for these rich, the more selfish their lifestyle is, the greater is the degree of guilt they will incur. The great Puritan writer John Flavel wrote that the heart of man is at his worst part before it is regenerated. And that's what we see with his wicked wealthy. And the best afterwards, when it is regenerated, it is the seed of principles and the fountain of actions. That is our heart. And let's not fatten it as we were unregenerated. Let's use it for God's glory as a fountain of generosity for God's glory. Our money talks primarily about how we give it. Some people give their money to themselves in self-indulgence like that sultan, while others give it to the Lord to advance his kingdom. The man James has in mind here had ill-gotten names gains to himself. And it's not what we guard, but what we give that makes us rich. They had it flipped. When we guard our earthly treasure, it rots, it ruins, it rusts. When one day we will stand up to testify against us, money will talk. Does it say, give me any way you can? Just get me, get me. Guard me and, and hoard and hold me tightly. Keep me, clutch me. Is that what it says? Or does your money say, spend it on yourself and no one else? And if so, it has become your master, your, your God. Money talks and gives glory to God when it says, give me a way to others in the service of Jesus Christ. That is where God is made much of. And so lastly, we should be careful not to hurt innocent people for the sake of our profit. Verse 6, let's not hurt we talked about hoarding and cheating and living in self-indulgence, and now we need to be careful not to hurt innocent people. James in verse 6 says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Is he literally speaking this, or is he figuratively speaking this? I, in a way, it, it kind of could be both. Certainly, figuratively, the rich would be, in effect, put to death, the righteous man, by cheating him out of his wages to the point where maybe he and his family don't have enough money. They're forced to starvation, possibly. That word murdered was also mentioned earlier in James, which I think it probably means that they hated or murdered these poor in their hearts or those that were less fortunate than they. But the idea of condemned, you have condemned 
is that the rich took advantage of the legal system. Now think about that. Maybe these people hire the best silver tongue lawyers. They influence judges with bribes. That's nothing new, right? <laughs> they use those lawyers to give them an unfair advantage over the poor. They drag the poor into the law courts and they did it all under the pretentious guise of, well, it's legal. We are not breaking any laws. You need to execute these. They're not, they're not paying their... Technically, they may have been correct, but morally they were rotten to the core and broke God's laws regarding just treatment of one fellow man. So their mouths will not be able to make any vain defense before the judge who sees their hearts. The rich who condemn will be condemned. Trust God in the end. And lastly, in that phrase, he does not resist you. Possibly the poor did not resist because they couldn't afford a defense lawyer. Whatever the specifics were, it's clear that the poor realized they were no match for the wicked oppressors, and so they acquiesced out of necessity. And isn't that awful? Exploitation. John MacArthur even says that, in fact, they maintained a spirit of gentleness and meekness, possibly. And so by doing, they manifested the same attitude of Jesus. These, these Christ followers were, were submitting under the, the hand of God, trusting that he will judge justly. So why would James spend six verses denouncing those who are possibly probably outside of the church and who maybe never even would read this warning anyway? I think it's similar to when the Old Testament prophets pronounced woes on Israel's pagan enemies. Isaiah did that in like chapters 13 through 19. But all these woes to these other nations that he probably wouldn't go to their ears. Why? What's the purpose of these? I believe there's two. These warnings, they should encourage us to know that God is one who is faithful. And if we endure, we can know that in due time he will judge the wicked. He will make things right. And secondly, it should warn us not to fall into any of the sins that will bring judgment on the wicked. Learn from their example. In the case James is addressing, it's easy when you're poor and oppressed to think, if I could just get rich, I will no longer have to deal with these problems. So we can be tempted to pursue wealth mistakenly thinking that happiness lies in getting rich. But because wealth can be a dangerous trap, we need to be careful not to use it in an ungodly manner, but to be faithful with it. So a businessman in closing once had an angel visit him, promising to grant one request. The man asked for a copy of the stock market page one year in the future. As he was studying the numbers on the future exchange and gloating over how much he would make because of his knowledge of the future, his eye glazed across the page. And in that glance, his picture was in the obituary column. <laughs> Suddenly, his new wealth faded into insignificance in light of his own death. Wealth is a great tool. And many of us here are using it for the glory of God, and I give them praise for that. But it's a dangerous trap if we adopt a worldly perspective towards it. So I encourage me and you to examine often our stewardship of the resource that God has entrusted you. Because remember Paul's words that it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. All for the glory and honor of Jesus. Amen? So let's spend about six or seven minutes and talk in application to what we just heard. You know, most Americans are rich by worldly standards, but how can we know when we're guilty of living in luxury, when we kind of crossed over? How do we know? Talk about that. And, and how can we know when we cross the line from prudent savings for the future versus ungodly hoarding? Where is that line? And then thirdly, is it wrong for a Christian to own nice things or to buy non-necessary items when we think there's so much need in the world? Why or why not? We won't solve the world's problems in these five minutes, but we'll pick some brains, okay? So spend a few minutes and then we'll close in the time of prayer.